Well, I think we're, I'm in the right spot at the right time. I, I think somehow we got messed up, and I'm, I'm not sure it was your fault or mine, Tim, but anyway, we're here, and uh, we're ready to go. A sermon, uh, service uh, this morning has been wonderful. Thank you for special music for the choir. Um, wow. Um, it is certainly a, one of those patriotic days, isn't it? As we, we share this morning, um, the scripture that I've chosen is um, a little book that Titus, or uh, called Titus, that the Apostle Paul wrote. Uh, Titus was ministering in the island of Crete, and uh, Paul was trying to encourage him and uh, give him some direction. And here are these words found in Titus chapter 1, starting with verse 10 through 15. For there are many rebellious people who engage in useless talk and deceive others. This is especially true of those who insist on circumcision for salvation. They must be silenced because they are turning whole families away from the truth by their false teaching, and they do it only for money. Even one of their own men, a prophet from Crete, has said about them, the people of Crete are all liars, cruel animals, and lazy gluttons. Interesting description. This is true, Paul says, so reprimand them sternly to make them strong in the faith. They must stop listening to the Jewish myths and the commands of people who have turned away from the truth. Everything is pure to those whose heart are pure, but nothing is pure to those who are corrupt and unbelieving because their minds and consciences are corrupted. Back in 1983, the Princeton Religion Research Center published a landmark survey that was conducted for the Wall Street Journal by the Gallup organization. The researchers measured a wide range of moral and ethical behaviors, such as calling in sick when you're not, uh, cheating on income tax, and pilfering company supplies for personal use. The results were disappointing to say the least. What the researchers found was most startling. They found that there was no significant difference between the churched and the unchurched in their ethics and values on the job. Do you get that? It said there was very, very little difference between the churched and the unchurched in their ethics and values on the job. Now, somehow, I don't think that's how it was meant to be. What do you think? Despite the fact that people were attending churches, churches seemed to be having less and less impact on the moral fiber of their people, at least in the workplace and in their everyday activities. To quote the researchers, these findings will come as a shock to the religious leaders and underscore the need for the religious leaders to channel the new religious interest in America, not simply into religious involvement, but into deep spiritual commitment. And as I, I thought about those things, I, I realized that what we are doing here at Visalia Methodist right now, with the, the emphasis upon our grace groups. This is exactly what we are trying to do. We are trying to get men and women involved in a deeper spiritual commitment where we share from our own personal lives and we encourage one another and we experience and we share grace. Thomas Linacre was Henry IV's doctor a Renaissance thinker, and he said this after he was given the four Gospels in Greek, quote, either these are not the Gospels or we're not Christians. What Linacre recognized was there was a great disparity between what people who proclaim Christ and how they lived their lives. So the question is, here we are now, many hundreds of years later in the 21st century, how then shall we live our lives as Christians? 
You see, I believe that if our faith is not validated through our behavior, then one must question whether we really even have a genuine relationship with Christ. The Apostle Paul didn't like what he saw, what was happening to the believers on the Isle of Crete. That's why he wrote to Titus. These people proclaim Christ with their mouth, but their behavior looked no different than those who did not claim Christ. Sounds familiar, doesn't it? Well, you don't even have to go, I mean, you can go much further back than the people on the Isle of Crete. That's nothing new. You see, even from the Old Testament, we can see this. Let's go all the way back to the Exodus. During the Exodus, as Moses led the people out of, the, of Egypt, and they were in the desert, God guided them by his presence. Exodus chapter 13, verses 21 and 22. Love these two verses. It says, and the Lord went ahead of them. He guided them during the day with a pillar of cloud, and he provided light at night with a pillar of fire, a cloud by day and a pillar of cloud by, or a pillar of fire by night. This allowed them to travel by day or by night. And verse 22, and the Lord did not remove the pillar of cloud or the pillar of fire from its place in front of the people. In other words, God guided them in the wilderness by his very presence, a visible thing. Now, you'd think that that would be enough for the Israelites, wouldn't you? To see the very presence of God, but it wasn't. And so it's still a problem today, isn't it? One of the great dangers in Christian ministry is to move from a presence-based work, a sense of God being with you, and then begin to operate purely on our natural instincts. Once we do something regularly, it can lead us to complacency. Now, I found this to be true in way too many times in ministry. And we can see it, but when Moses had the same problem, things were really going well for Moses as he led the people out of Egypt. They were headed for the promised land. God then called Moses to go up on Mount Horeb where he was going to give him the Ten Commandments. It's called the, the mountain of God. But Moses was gone for a while, too long for the people of Israel, and they began to worry. The presence of God has left us. And so what did they do? Some of you remember. They had Aaron get all sites of gold and melt it down, and then we have the golden calf. On Aaron's watch, Moses' brother, this revealed that the spiritual foundation of the people and the leadership of Aaron would not, were not grounded enough for the leaders, Moses, to have an extended absence. Too long gone. Maybe he's dead. What are we going to do? We'll build an idol. Now, after God had led them and they had seen God's presence, and this is what they did. And when Moses came back and saw what had happened, he recognized the solution as well. Having God's presence returned was the only way that they could proceed and have success. Well, later on in Exodus, in chapter 33, Moses says in verse 16, How will anyone know that you look favorably on me and upon your people if you don't go with us, Lord? For your presence among us sets your people and me apart from all the people of the earth. How then shall we live? Well, I think it is clear God's having God's presence in our lives is the only way we can really proceed and have that growing relationship with Christ. 
One of, we've just recently celebrated Easter, a wonderful day in the church. But what happens 50 days after Easter? Say it, somebody said it. Pentecost, exactly. And what is the significance of Pentecost? Pentecost is the time when the, it's the birth of the church, but not just the birth of the church. What happens is the Holy Spirit comes and rest with the people, God's presence with us always. You see, this is what sets us apart. Not only do we have Christ, we have his presence with us constantly. And in that, it should empower us to live in such a way that when people of the world see us, They see Christ in us. Some time ago, Kelly sent out an email to all of the other staff. And uh, and in that email, she sent an article um, that was titled, that really intrigued me, 12 Reasons Churches Don't Produce Growth. The author wrote these words. How do we help people see how the Bible addresses real life issues? How do we help people look to God's word when they need wisdom? How do we provide tools to the people and encourage the people and give them the right expectations to move people to a place where they become self-feeders? That's an interesting description of us, isn't it? Self-feeders. In other words, You're not depending upon a pastor or someone else for your spiritual growth. You're saying, this is what I want for me. This is what I need. And you begin searching, whether it's through your personal home studies, whether it's getting involved in in a Bible study or a grace group, whatever. We'll talk more about that in a moment. The, The challenge, he goes on, the author of this article, the challenge is that we'll have to provide practical next steps to help people to embrace new spiritual disciplines. That's the responsibility of the church then, isn't it? Providing next steps. Remember, teaching has the potential to shift thinking while systems or spiritual disciplines has the potential to shift behavior. See, that's what we need, isn't it? To shift behavior. And that comes through practicing of spiritual disciplines. The church needs to challenge people to be the church. We need to encourage people to listen to and to be obedient to God and God's calling in their lives. If we see a need, they need to address that need. If they need help, they need to talk to their friends to get some help. If they need money, they need to become good stewards of what God has provided so that they can be generous with their church and their personal mission. Interesting article that it was. But the challenge for us today, the challenge is that we, we need to, we will have to free people up to become obedient to God's prompting without accepting that prompting as the church's responsibility. Let me say that again. We need to free people up to be obedient to God's prompting without accepting that prompting as the church's responsibility. It's because as we become followers of Jesus Christ, it's something I should de- desire to do rather than it's because what Pastor Don or Pastor Steve or Kelly or someone else tells you to do. It becomes your desire to please God. As God's spirit resides in us, those are the changes that comes. So here's the question I'm hoping some of you will ask at this point. <laughs> well, Pastor Don, how do I do this? Well, I'm glad you asked. 
And even if you aren't asking that question, at least listen and hear me out. Even if you aren't um, that interested, to say, well, maybe, maybe this is what I need. You know, what I'm doing isn't working for me. Maybe I need this. So here's what I believe. If we want to continue growing in our Christian faith, we just can't sit back and see what happens. We've got to be proactive. Now, that's an interesting word, proactive. I, did, I, did I use it correctly? So I went to my, my computer and found my thesaurus, and I checked the word to see if I'd used it correctly, and yes, I had. And in that, guess what? I found not only a synonyms, I found an antonym. And anybody want to guess what an antonym of proactive might be? Inactive, that's not bad. How about passive? And you see, that's what I think many Christians today have become. We've become passive. We come and we sit and we listen and we go back and just another week and another week and we sit and we listen. How then do I move from being passive to being proactive in my Christian growth? What do I need to do? Well, there's some answers in your bulletin, in fact. This morning at 10.30 in room F2122, Dick Byard's going to be leading a Sunday school class on the parables. Got five more weeks in the class. Why not come and see what Jesus has to say about the parables? You say, well, you know, Don, that doesn't really interest me. Well, there's a group called the Women of Faith. They meet, I think, in the library. If not, the bulletin will tell you where they meet. And, you know, they probably have been meeting for, I think, as long as I've been a pastor here and probably much longer than that. And I bet you they'd be happy to welcome a new lady into their church, into their little group. There's another group that meets. In fact, it's in uh, F24, if I'm cr counting correctly. It's called, what is it, Edith? Knit? Knit one, crochet two. I knew it had knit and crochet in it. If you're a knitter and a crocheter, come. And they do a little devotional, and they share, and they talk, and they encourage each other. So those are some of the things on Sunday morning, but... How about Thursday morning, gentlemen? Eight o'clock, we have a Bible study. We're doing the book of Colossians right now. We meet at Ryan's, have breakfast, have about a 25, 30 minute Bible study most every week. Thursday mornings. Thursday mornings at 9.30. From 9.30 to 10, they have sort of a fellowship time. The ladies right here in our coffee, uh, uh, oh, F1011, where you're probably having your coffee hour this morning. They, I, I, I attended the women's Bible study last Sunday, or Thursday, excuse me, and um, boy, it's a great group, great discussion, and a chance to grow, and a cr chance to, to, to pray for one another and encourage one another. This, this afternoon, you know, if I asked some of you to come and stand up here and share your testimony, you'd say, Don, I could never do that. And yet we've had numerous men and women who have stood right be at this very pulpit in recent months because they went to Pastor Steve's study. But you know, just because you go there doesn't mean you have to come and give your testimony. Why don't some of you say, you know, I'd like to be able to, to put down in words what I believe. I'd encourage you to show up there this week or next month to go and, and you know, it's, it's, I, I remember when I first wrote down my testimony. It was hard, but how meaningful it was as I looked to see what God had done and was doing in my life. And wouldn't some of you benefit from that as well? But I really where I want to spend a little bit more time in talking because this is where I believe it could really happen. 
I won't ask those who are in grace groups to stand. I'd love to do that. But, but you know, we have more than a handful. In fact, um, I, I was going through, if you haven't seen one, look for one of these signs. It tells you there are seven women's grace groups and five men. Men, we got to catch up to ladies. Come on, men. Um, we, got, we got, what's that, seven? That's 12, isn't it? And you multiply that by seven or eight, uh, you figure how many people are involved in grace groups. But in all honesty, that's what, about half the church, maybe close to it. And that's good. But they meet at all times of the time of day. We got morning and we got afternoon, we got evening. And if you're not in one of those grace groups, I would encourage you to do that. Some of the men that, uh, in the group that I lead ha- have shared with me that it, this has been a significant experience for them in their Christian faith as they begin to practice grace. But even more than that, as we begin to share honestly with one another, to pray with one another, to pray for one another. Think about it. Pray about it. Look for one of these sheets around here, and there's email addresses for each of the leaders to find a time that fits you for the, a women's study or a men's study, and we keep them separate for reasons. Let me encourage you, encourage you. If you want to grow in your faith, there is one good way to do it. A few years back, I, uh, I was walking, my office is right over here in this building, and all the others, they, they've put me in outer Mongolia for some reason. I'm not really quite sure. But uh, so I, I was walking over to the offices, um, and, and Mike Cates was out, and he had this, some kind of measuring device that he was dropping down the well. I said, what's up, Mike? He says, well, I'm, I'm trying to measure the water table. Now, this was during what we know as the big drought. I said, well, how's it look? And his comment to me, it says, drop 10 feet. Not good. And we know that if we continue to pump water from uh, the aquifers and from the the water table that is below our earth, what's going to happen? It's going to run out eventually, isn't it? That's why when I drive from Porterville over here, I pass three, I don't know what they call them, holding ponds? Three of them. There's acres and acres that look like lakes. Why are they there? So ducks will have a place to, no, that's not what it's for. I do see a lot of ducks, some geese, but it's there for a purpose. It's to recharge the water table below. I don't know. I haven't asked Mike. I meant to do that for the sermon, and I forgot. Mike, how's the water table looking? It's okay. But, but you know, with the rain that we've had, the snow, with, you know, with the recharging, well, hopefully, you know, we're going to, it's going to recharge it. But we can't do a lot about the water table below us. But we can sure do a lot about recharging our spiritual lives. And that's what God wants us to do. How then shall we live? We need to be intentional, not passive, but proactive. We need to be doing things to be sure that we are growing in our faith. And not only growing in our faith, but being transformed by God's renewing of our mind, so that when they come and do that study for us, well, how is your ethics? That we stand out and we're different. And we look more like Jesus Christ because we are followers of the one who came and lived among us and showed us how to live and then died and rose again and then sent God sent the Holy Spirit 
which I think if I'm not, I, I forgot to look, but I think it's next Sunday we celebrate Pentecost, the day that the Holy Spirit came to the church. But we don't have to wait, do we? For the Holy Spirit is here. And if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit is here. And that Holy Spirit can empower you, my friends, can change you, can change the way you think and the way you act and the way you are. And that you might look more like Jesus day by day how then shall we live as fully surrendered unto him saying lord lead me let me grow up and to become the man or the woman that you've created to me to be like jesus amen amen